Good morning, Dan and Amy. So uh, in the wake of uh, Charlottesville and you combine that with the combination, uh, or you combine that, I should say, with the violence that uh, we've reported on over the last couple of years and uh, on, on college campuses and just the general tone and tenor, at least as it's pr uh, presented through the filter of the D.C. press corps of race relations in this country and relations across all kinds of other uh, identities, uh, the state of identity politics and its impact on culture. Um, this is the uh, topic that is really uh, focusing people's attention, including uh, Jordan Peterson, University of Toronto psychology professor, who uh, had this to say in a recent talk. Like I, like I understand why the identity politics that has been practiced so assiduously and so devastatingly by the left has been co-opted by the right. I understand that. But then here's what I would say to the people on the right who are playing that game. If you play the game of your enemies and you win, you win their game. You don't win. That's not victory. You just become the most successful exponent of their pathology. Well, how is that a good thing? It's a bad thing. And uh, even some uh, erstwhile uh, men and women of the left seem to be agreeing with that. I mean, Frank Rich, New York Times columnist, who's left, um, he had to draw a line when that uh, Middlebury uh, professor was assaulted on campus for the crime of walking on campus with Charles Murray uh, and other such instances of you know, crossing the line from even spirited debate, even ignorant uh, communication to actual violence. And uh, it seems like uh, Columbia University professor Mark Lilla is also challenging some of the orthodoxies of the left in its modern incarnation. He's the author of the new book, The Once and Future Liberal, after identity politics, and he joins us now. Professor Lilla, thanks so much for being with us. Appreciate it. Good to be here. Um, so uh, you've uh, taken on some water from uh, the uh, neo-left, if you will, including Matt Iglesias, who says there is no other way to do politics other than to do it via identity politics. You seem to dispute that contention. Oh, historically, it's false. I mean... Uh, when John F. Kennedy said, ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country, I fail to see the identity dimension to that. Uh, when Franklin Delano Roosevelt laid out the four freedoms that were the foundation of the New Deal, uh, there was not an appeal to identity there. Now, it's true, and Roosevelt's a good example, that um, in order to understand our social problems and our social failures, one needs to understand identity. And in fact, the New Deal did not fully incorporate African Americans. But in order to pull a country together and address those uh, problems and build bridges between people, you need to appeal to a vision of the kind of country we want to build and a vision of what our national destiny is. Well, what's your vision of a country you'd want to build or our national destiny? Well, I think what's missing in our country right now is a sense of um, social solidarity, a sense of citizenship. Um, we, we really have uh, are in the grip of two different ideolo uh, libertarian ideologies, uh, individualism, one of the right and one of the left. Uh, on the right, an individualism that came out of Reaganism that says uh, we're all just individuals here. The country is just a big campsite, and you plug in your RV. And uh, you have nothing to do with your neighbors, and good luck to you. And, and on the left, an, an individualism, a narcissism about identity. And we've not been able to speak uh, to on neither side to what kind of common project we can build together through solidarity. Are, are there um, like specific examples in the in the recent past of the the identity politics pathology, my word, not yours? that uh, you're, you're describing? Well, you described a few of those on our campuses, but uh, one example is that when Hillary Clinton was on the stump in the 2016 election, she would always call out the various groups that um, are, are the groups that Democrats think about. And so she 
called back to African Americans, Latinos, women, uh, gays. Now, that leaves out a lot of the country. And if you're going to list all the groups in the country, you better list all of them. Otherwise, people are going to feel left out and resentful. Um, and so her strategy was to target groups rather than laying out uh, a theme and, as, as I keep saying, appealing to the imagination of the American public and getting us back on track to doing something together. And she failed to do that. Yeah, I mean, I've always maintained that instead of hanging out with Jay-Z and Beyonce, she should have been hanging out with George Strait because don't you think she completely alienated the white people in this country? Well, do you think George Strait wants to hang out with her? Well, I don't yeah. <laughs> Well, frankly, I, I, I've never understood anti-Hillaryism. Uh, I find it, a, frankly, a kind of mental pathology, uh, the obsession with her. Um, but, but no, they have George Strait along. It's just to play the group game again. You know, um, it's not to speak to, to all of us. You know, what I worry about is that Democrats are going to uh, interpret this, but, you know, criticism of identity politics, meaning that we now have to shift and talk to the white working class. But that's just one more group. Yeah. Right. And someone else right. is going to feel left out. Well, and that's what that Rob, goes. And I'm sorry to interrupt, but that goes to Jordan Peterson's point is. And, and hey, are oh, oh, you on this on the right or the center right? You shouldn't be playing that game either because it ends, it, it all leads to the same bad place. Yeah, and, and that's where the country is there. You know, we've become a more individualistic country. We don't talk about civic duty. We don't talk about sacrifice. When is the last time a president asked us to sacrifice for the common good? It hasn't happened since the 1960s. And, and as some, and, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, no, no. I'm just going to say that uh, instead we keep making promises we can't keep to every group. Right. But we've got to do something to pull us together and make people understand they owe something to each other. That's what this country is about. It's not just everyone for himself. Right. It's about being neighborly and helping each other out, right, or being a member of society. Right. And people do that in their neighborhoods and so on less than they used to, but they also – you know, it's legitimate that we use government for certain purposes, and you have a duty to pay your taxes, you have a duty to vote, and if you can, to uh, you know, serve in the military or go teach for America, but um, you know, do something for your country uh, and stop just demonizing government and politicians. Well, what about, uh, since you're a member of the academy, what about the state of affairs on college campuses and how— uh, some of what we see on college campuses, uh, of course, bleeds into uh, culture more generally, the workplace and uh, uh, boardrooms and uh, uh, social gatherings and uh, civic institutions, right? It, it's not contained. What happened at Middlebury, what happened at Berkeley, what happened at Evergreen State, that's not contained to those campuses. Uh, no, it's not. But, you know, frankly, when you're living on a campus, you see very little of this. There, there's just, you know, every once in a while there's, a, you know, a crazy event, which then the media is able to pick up on. So it's not always present. So it's in the atmosphere. But it does reflect the mentality about politics, that politics is about identity and not about the common good. But when it comes to the boardroom and things like that, that's something else. There, we're trying to build a more diverse society so that people can feel more included. You can argue about the way we do that, and we can have disagreements about that. But I myself think that uh, though there are some excesses and some craziness in that, it's, it's a good thing to do. What about uh, social media and its impact? Uh, Megan McCardle had a good piece in uh, Bloomberg about uh, living in fear of online mobs, and she Use the James Damore memo, the Google software engineer, and just suggest, you know, 20 years ago, if uh, some tech company software engineer said something, uh, wrote a memo about not liking the uh, diversity training at his company and, and thinking they're missing this point and that point, something that was substantive but critical, uh, it hardly would become the national issue that, it, that his memo became. And, uh, and, and how social media propagates this culture of identity politics as well? Well, yeah, on, on the right and the left, but it propagates all kinds of craziness. I mean, it just doesn't permit reason debate about anything. Um, I, don't part, I don't use social media, but after my article, uh, the book is based on an article I did last year that was the most written political article in the New York Times of 2016, and I got my first Twitter bath. 
And, um, you know, I got the threat. And, you know, I had no idea of what a sewer it was. And, uh, you know, no wonder we're in the shape we're in. So you avoid Facebook, too, Instagram, all of that? All of that. I no. don't use any of that. No. no. Where do you post pictures of your dog? I mean, you got to have some place yeah. to put that, right? Um, is yeah, it, why... Uh, no, go ahead. Uh, just in terms of getting back to your book, The Once and Future Liberal, uh, what are your prescriptions? I know you've talked about them kind of in the abstract, but your prescriptions for uh, how we become a more liberal, small L society once again in terms of tolerance and intelligent discussion and uh, uh, reason consideration of complicated issues and the like. Well, uh, frankly, that's a little less the focus of the book um, than it is liberal in the more, um, you know, ideological sense. I mean, what I call for is for the liberal side, American liberals, to start focusing on their vision and to start focusing on electoral politics, because Democrats are very focused on movement politics. But a group of movements don't constitute a vision. And Democrats are not competitive in half of this country. Mm -hmm. And so they need to be able to address people outside of, outside of our bubble. And, and just that, just doing that, having to address people, I think will, will uh, pull people out more, make them more civic-minded. If you have to go to a place uh, that you're not used to and somehow make the case. And liberals are very resistant to this. You know, they would prefer to hope that demographics are going to sweep them into power, but it's not going to happen. Well, that's I was interested. I've seen a lot of the reaction. I, Frank Rich has reacted well to your arguments, but uh, many others, including some of the leading lights on the left, as I mentioned at the outset, Matt Iglesias and, uh, and uh, uh, Michelle Goldberg over at Slate, have not reacted so favorably. So what's, what's the overall reaction you're getting from your uh, you know, erstwhile fellow travelers? Yeah, well, they're divided, you know. Um, you know, th there are people who are so committed um, to the identity viewpoint, and I, and I don't include their Matt Iglesias or uh, Michelle Goldberg, and we have disagreements, but there are people who, are so, who are, have only thought about politics in this way, and those people right now are unreachable. My audience, I think, are liberals who have felt this way for a long time, are frustrated with losing, are sick of noble defeats, and uh, want the Democratic Party to be a national party for everyone again. And I hope to give them a way of thinking about this and a way of talking about this and confronting uh, the identity mentality that's uh, taken us off the court. All right. He is Columbia University Humanities Professor Mark Lilla. He's the uh, uh, author of the book, The Once and Future Liberal After Identity Politics. Mark, thanks so much for joining us. Appreciate it. Have a good day. And he joined us on our turnkey.pro answer line. There's only one radio.